Hi Ninja Nerds and welcome to Ninja Nerd Nursing. Today we're going to talk about fat embolism. So if you like this video make sure to give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and don't forget to subscribe to this channel. I'm really excited for it and I hope it really helps you guys out. And let's get started with Ninja Nerd Nursing on fat embolism. So fat embolism, what is that? What are we going to be talking about today? So we know Embolism, we've heard that word before. We may have heard it before when we were talking about some type of blockage, right? And that's basically what embolism means. But today we're going to specifically be talking about fat embolism. So a globule of fat, triglycerides, that can obstruct something that's really important to us, like our brain or our heart or our lungs, and then potentially cause life-threatening problems, right? So a fat embolism is what? It's basically lipids, or triglycerides that cause some sort of occlusion, right? That's the easiest way to describe it, is there is some type of occlusion that is occurring from some sort of fat, right? And it can be life-threatening, so we want to think about what could cause life-threatening issues, right? We have a blockage to our brain, that could be causing an issue, a blockage to our heart, or a blockage to our lungs. Those are the three that we're going to keep hitting on when we talk about fat embolism. So if it's life-threatening, it's an occlusion, but how does this occur? What, how does fat all of a sudden go from where it's supposed to be to where it shouldn't be? So let's back it up a little bit and talk about some of the risk factors and what's going on within our body. So in our body, we have lots of long bones, right? We have to think back to anatomy and physiology and think about what are those long bones. So if you start rattling them off in your head right now, you can think about we got the tibia, we got the fibula, right? And we got our femur. We got humerus, radius, ulna, don't forget all of our phalanges. Some of the other bones we have is our metatarsals. Our metacarpals. And there's one that people always forget. And the only way I remembered it is that somebody said, you're always clever if you remember that the long bone, this is a long bone. So you're always clever if you remember that the clavicle is a long bone. So you want to put in your clavicle, right? So any of these long bones, basically, that sustain some type of fracture, right, or multiple fractures, this is one of our risk factors. So let's talk that one more th time through. We have a risk factor for a fat embolism. That is going to be a fracture of a long bone. What are our long bones? All the ones that we just talked about right there. But there's some other risk factors as well. It's not just the long bones. They can also be if there's a break in our pelvis, right? Or multiple fractures. So we have a broken pelvis and a broken femur and tibia, right? Or we have a broken humerus with a broken radius and ulna, right? We're just lopping off lots of long bones or we have a pelvic uh, break as well. We also want to look into something that people consider a lot doing if they have the money for is liposuction. Liposuction is suctioning fat, right? And if we are suctioning fat out and we are nicking those nearby vessels and a little bit of those lipids or triglycerides or fat globules get into circulation, that can also cause a risk for a fat embolism. Also, a parenteral infusion of lipids if they're not put in properly. And also, a secondary, a non-traumatic, something that wouldn't be traumatic but something within the body it would be sickle cell crisis. Someone who's in sickle cell crisis can also have this. So we're talking about what the risk factors are and you're thinking, I, don't, I still don't really get it. Like how does like the fat get in there? How does it just go from where it shouldn't be to where it, where it should be to where it shouldn't be? So let's review a little more of anatomy and physiology about our long bones. So remember in our long bones, we have this opening in them and that's our medullary cavity, right? And in there we have our bone marrow. Well, what happens is within these fractures, right, we get a fracture, we get some type of break within the bone, and it disrupts this cavity, this cavity where our bone marrow is. So now, all of a sudden, these globules that are within here can enter into these small little vessels that are within our bones. They take that little bit, and it starts to travel, right? And as it travels, 
there can be some uh, there can be some adhesion or aggregation of these fat globules into an area. And when they start to accumulate in some type of area, ones like I've mentioned time and time again, our brain, our lungs, our heart, they start to cause some symptoms and cause some other issues within our body. So the simple version of it is that within our body, within our long bones, we have this cavity that holds our bone marrow. We get a break. It breaks off some of those fat globules. Fat globules go into our systemic circulation and they go to an area where they eventually occlude. Now, sometimes it's so minute that we don't even notice that this happens, if there's orthopedic surgeries or anything like that, where the body will just take care of it on its own and it doesn't cause any issues. But on that rare time where it goes through and goes all the way to the body and then starts causing all of these signs and symptoms that this patient starts to manifest with, we call that fat embolism syndrome. So that is one problem that we can have with the pathophysiology. The other thing is that we can have our platelet adhesion here. So we have a fat globule, and our flat, fat globule starts to get all these platelets that adhere on the outside. Because of that adhesion, so we're going to put platelet adhesion. Right? What's that mean? It's taking all the platelets that we have within our body, and now they're going to adhere to this fat globule. And you're going to start thinking, okay, so if their platelets are going to this fat globule, our platelet number is going to go down. If our platelet number is going down, what does that cause in our body? What, what is the medical term for that? Do you remember what it is? Let's use blue because the blue looks better on the board. That's thrombocytopenia, right? And that's a problem, right? Now we don't have the ready amount of platelets for us to to be able to clot, so now we're gonna have an issue down the line with something else. And the last is gonna be in the realm of our non-traumatic. So somebody who has some type of response, non-traumatic to anything that's been broken or surgery, but they have something else, underlying conditions that are going on. And what happens is stress is out our body and our body starts to have an increase in our cytokine levels, right? So our C-reactive protein, our CRP, right? That level's gonna go up. Because of that, we're going to have agglutination. And you're like, I used to remember what that word means, agglutination. So we have this clumping of all of our chylo, there we go, microns. And what is the issue with that? When we have that agglutination of the chylomicrons, we have that clumping. Now we don't have those things ready available. Because of that, this is going to allow fat emboli to form. All right. So we've talked about the pathophysiology about how a fat embolism can occur and why is that occurring and how does it come to be a fat embolism that causes fat embolism syndrome. Now we're going to go and talk about the signs and symptoms as to somebody who is developing fat embolism syndrome because there is a triad of symptoms that we're going to be looking for and how we discuss and uh, diagnose this patient with a fat embolism or fat embolism syndrome. So let's go talk about that now. All right, now we have a patient that we think has fat embolism syndrome. How are we going to recognize that? What are some of the clinical manifestations or things that we also call signs and symptoms that would make us think, hmm, I think this patient has fat embolism syndrome. So looking at the signs and symptoms here, there are gonna be changes in a bunch of different categories or changes in a bunch of different systems. But I want you guys to think it back to the anatomy and physiology of what are the things that we wanna keep perfusing no matter what, the really, really important stuff. And that's going to be, our airway or our respiratory, our neurological or our cardiac. So that's why I picked these three colors here, kind of helps us with everything. So the first signs and symptoms are gonna be a change in respiratory, All right? So we're gonna start thinking, what are some signs and symptoms that we would be like, hmm, I think this patient is having something going on respiratory wise. So what is a change in the respiratory that we would think, all right, I'm gonna start looking into this more. Well, the first thing is gonna be hypoxia, right? Maybe they're showing a drop in their O2 stat and we're thinking, hmm, that's not good. Or maybe they're just, you know, looking a little rough, like maybe their respiratory rate has increased, so they're looking to kipnic. So they got to kipnia. Maybe they're having some dyspnea. They're having some problem breathing, right? So these three things we're gonna think, okay, I think something's going on with this patient 
Now I want to assess this further. What is one way we can assess them further as nurses? We can auscultate, right? And when we listen to their lungs, maybe we're hearing diminished sounds, or maybe we're hearing crackles, but something that is just different, right? Maybe there's even little wheezes, we don't know. So we're gonna go into other things, because we're nurses, we don't just stop at one assessment, we're gonna keep continuing on. We're gonna say, okay, so now I think this patient is having some type of issue with their neuro, right? So neurological. What are some changes in the neurological assessment that we're gonna think, okay, Something is going on with this patient. I don't know what it is, but I need to assess them further. Well, the biggest thing we can always say is a change in the mental status, right? So a change in mental status. So are they acting more confused than they were earlier? Are they becoming unresponsive? Are they having some type of dif differential like recall? They're not calling, recalling everything as well as they did before. So any type of neurological change, they're having some deficits that we're noticing. Maybe they're not moving something as great as they were before, one side, both sides, we're gonna think, okay, their coordination's looking off, I'm thinking something's going on neurologically. So then we're gonna run through our assessment, right? We're gonna check, ask them to do some commands, tell us their name, date, time, where are they, why are they here, what's going on? And I always like to ask my patients things that you, you normally would ask them, what do you want for lunch? You know, So see if we could see if they're responding to us with an appropriate response. Then we're gonna go into our signs and symptoms of our cardiac, right? And what are some signs and symptoms of cardiac that we're gonna think, okay, something's going on with this patient. Do they have an occlusion? Do they have something else going on? So a couple things here, there could be changes in their EKG if they are on an EKG monitor or their telly, right? They could have some, they could be complaining of chest pain. They could all of a sudden have no chest pain and now they're having chest pain. But one of the signs and symptoms of the triad of things for um, fat embolism is a petechial rash, all right? So they break out in this rash, all right? And because of this rash, they are now going to have head to toe, chest, face, neck rash. And you're gonna think, okay, something's going on. So because of these big signs here that we're looking at, especially the things that we're looking at are the, the petechial rash, the change in the mental status, the hypoxia or tachypnea, something that is changing within their respiratory rate. We're gonna think, okay, I think something's going on with this patient and then we can report to the doctor, this is what I found. You know, this patient has a rash, they're kind of getting a little more dependent on their oxygen. Uh, they're kind of acting a little, um, they're not quite off yet, but it seems like they're getting a little more off than they were before. They're not really responding as fast or something like that. Then this is when we would talk to our provider and see if they want to run more tests. When they decide to run more tests, there's a couple different tests that they can run. All right, right away they're going to start with probably some blood work, right? If that morning blood work was normal, they're going to say, I'm going to do some blood work. So they're going to check CBC, you know, our basic panels. They're going to check some of their electrolytes. And on the CBC, what is something they might see? What is something that, that might come back? Remember we talked about it earlier in pathophysiology? It might show thrombocytopenia. Right? Which is telling us that there is possibly a fat emboli somewhere, and now there is going to be that uh, adhesion of all the platelets to that fat globule. What is another problem that this patient might have with blood work? They might also look anemic. Right, might be showing changes towards anemia. Then we have other things that we can go on to. So we have a patient that now might need a chest X-ray, right? So this patient goes in and gets a chest X-ray, right? We talked about this with the respiratory. They might have diminished crackles, right? Diminished sounds or crackles. So there might be something with on, on the chest X-ray. It might show some fluid in the lungs, might show some compression with on the lung, we don't know. So we're gonna do chest X-ray so we can check and make sure that there is no infiltrates within this patient. So there might be bilateral infiltrates. All right, so we're like, okay. And then there is one other diagnostic test that we can do in order for us to be able to see what's going on with this patient. So 
the patient has a fat embolism or it's ha they're having some type of issue where these fat globules are kind of just getting thrown in a couple different places, there's going to be two spots that we can check that these fat globules might show up. And that's going to be a urinalysis or a sputum analysis. And both of these will have positive globules. Not at the same time necessarily for both patient or for one patient, but some patients might show positive urine uh, analysis with fat globules. Some will have a sputum with fat globules in it. And it's just another sign for us to think, okay, something's going on with our patient. So we can go into even further than evaluate and work with a provider. This is something that the provider will do, not necessarily the nurse at bedside, but I wanted to touch on it so that we can understand what's going on or why we think this patient definitely has a fat embolism. So right here we have GERDS criteria. So with the GERDS criteria, this criteria, depending on the facility that you work at and what the provider likes to use, they might use GERDS. With GERDS criteria, we're looking for a patient that either has one min minor, sorry, major, let me back that up for a second, one major and four minor. Okay, so in this criteria, they're gonna have one major and four minor. So if patient's looking hypoxic, right? And then you go in and you're seeing that they all of a sudden started with a fever, their heart's racing really fast, they're having troubles urinating, and then we also found there was fat globules in that sputum. This patient would meet the criteria for a possible fat embolism. All right, so when we're looking at this, it's really simple, simple. it's just something that you can think, oh, what was the criteria? What did the, what did the doc use in order to say, yeah, they definitely have a fat embolism? The other one is Sconfeld's. Sconfeld's is just a point system. So if you're somebody who likes point systems, he has, or they, have all of these symptoms here, and they have a point. So there's five, four, three, one, 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 one. And the criteria is, is if a patient scores greater than five, then they would be uh, meeting the criteria for fat embolism. So what we're looking at here is if they have petechial rash and they have tachypnea, then we're thinking, okay, this patient probably has a fat embolism. But there's many different criteria that we need to look at along with each patient because it's a case by case. So now we're at the point of, okay, our patient, I think, has a fat embolism, I'm pretty sure, or they do officially get diagnosed with a fat embolism, and we start treating them. Let's talk about how we're going to treat this patient in order to take care of them and make sure that this life-threatening doesn't get any worse and we can only get them back and get them feeling better. So let's talk about how we're going to treat this patient. Now we have a patient that we believe has or does have a fat embolism. How are we going to take care of them? So I broke it down into the four different cat categories that we can look into, but we always want to think of our patient as a whole. We're going to be caring for the whole patient and not just what's going on with them. But to break it down for us to understand and to keep learning, we're going to focus in on these four individual areas. So the first is going to be respiratory. So we talked about some of the signs and symptoms, right? So the way we can make sure that we're keeping our patient healthy and getting them better instead of worse is to one, we're gonna be listening, right? So we're gonna to listen to lung sounds or we're gonna auscultate, right? Maybe every shift, depends. We're also going to assess their O2 status, right? And what that means is, is this patient doing good on the current form of oxygen we're supplying with them? Do they need more? Do they need less? We're also gonna start thinking about how we can check them out. So they might be doing some type of O2 plus ambulation. When they are clear to do that, we're gonna be possibly, when it's time, having respiratory come in and teaching them how to do incentive spirometers if they're able to do it. But with respiratory, we are hopefully keeping the status and the patient comfortable, right? We don't want them getting too short of breath. We don't want them getting too reliant on oxygen, but we want to keep them definitely comfortable because when we talk about before, a patient who is possibly anemic and also having some respiratory issues with this fat embolism, they could not be perfusing as greatly as they should. So we want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on their perfusion, right? That O2 status is really, really important. And some signs that respiratory isn't doing good could manifest in neuro, right? So we're not perfusing oxygen to places that we need to. Now we're going to have some neurological changes. So what are we looking at here? 
with the neurological, we're going to keep doing our assessment, right? So we're going to be doing our neuro checks. Right. So we're going to make sure we're doing that, with, depending on what the protocol is at your facility. Are we doing those every four hours? Are we doing those every eight hours? Are we doing them every shift? Just making sure we're keeping up on how our patient's doing. We also want to be uh, checking in when we do neurological. We want to check about any type of paresthesia or any type of pain anywhere, any types of <clears throat> changes in our sensation. So how is their sensation? Then we want to go into our cardiac, right? So we're going to have that petechial rash that hopefully eventually clears up. But we also want to make sure that they are on telemetry. All right, is this patient on telemetry? We want to make sure we keep an eye on their chest pain if they do have an emboli there, right within the lung that could manifest as chest pain. Is it chest pain from the emboli? Or is this new chest pain, something else going on? We want to make sure we're keeping an eye on that as well. And then we also want to start thinking about how they are doing with that ambulation, right? If we're going to eventually get our patient up with ambulation, we're going to start moving them around. This is where these three kind of come into play, right? The patient's going to be ambulating. They're going to have an increase in oxygen demand. Are they going to be able to move? Are they having some type of ataxia within their neurological? And then are they having some tachycardia when they get up as well? So these are all things that we're going to be keeping an eye on when we're assessing our patient. Along with all that, are gonna, we're gonna have a patient that possibly had a broken bone or a broken pelvis. So all that supportive care that goes along with all of this, right? So this patient may be in, type of, in some type of traction. They might need a pain regimen. This is our onset of pain medication, right? We're also going to be doing supportive care for family members around as well as the patient. So their nutrition, right? We got to be make sure that they're eating and drinking. And then every other assessment that comes along with nursing, right? Are they having adequate output? Are they having adequate intake? Are they, are we meeting all of their needs on Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Are we able to, you know, keep their spirits up and, and have their family around? And all that supportive care comes into this. We also want to think about pain medication if somebody's having a non-traumatic type of reaction and getting a fat embolism. So what was the cause of that? Can we help with that supportive care as well? And if you look at all of this as a whole, it, it really creates that perfect picture of a patient that could possibly have developed a fat embolism and then also have a complete care plan right in front of you, right? This patient comes in because they broke three bones because they broke those three bones, they started to have a fat embolism, which then caused them to have some type of respiratory issue. That respiratory issue then caused some type of tachycardia, and then all of this together is causing a deficit in neuro. And when you look at this patient as a whole, and you start caring for them, you could be giving them pain medication that's all of a sudden giving, you know, making them maybe a little more forgetful, especially if somebody who's older. So you're gonna have pain medication, now they're acting funny. Or are they acting funny because it's a neuro change, or they're acting funny because they're on the pain medications. And that's why being a nurse is so important, being at the bedside so frequently, seeing that patient and really getting to, to, to know them more than just knowing them, but knowing their cues and seeing what's going on with their neuro checks. All of that's really gonna make you a better nurse. So I'm hoping that this treatment and this video makes you understand that it's not just one thing we're looking at. You know, this patient who's older and is having all these issues and it's getting pain meds, then you're going to start thinking, well, then maybe now they need a stool softener because now they're on all these opiates, you know, and it's just going to keep trickling down as you really want to look at this patient as a whole and not just one thing. They just have a fat embolism because that's not what we're treating. We're not just treating the fat embolism. We're treating everything that's going on with that patient at that time. And it's forever and always changing. So I hope this video made sense. I hope you learned something. And as always, until next time.